Uh, apologies for the delay in starting, uh, but welcome to the hottest ticket in town, discussion of the Kenyan elections. Um, we are not as late as some of the trains, uh, which means that uh, quite a few of our audience are joining us online rather than uh, in person. But the panel are all here, and therefore we're looking forward to a great discussion of what is going to be one of the most important elections in Africa this year, and these are, which is critical not just to Kenyans, but actually to the whole of Africa, I'd say even beyond. And obviously there are many people in this country, UK, who have uh, relations with Kenya, economic, political, personal, uh, and everybody will be watching very closely the outcome of this election. And therefore, our objective today is to try and find out what will happen. Uh, my name is Nick Westcott. I'm the director of the Royal African Society, who, whether, uh, together with the East African Association, who will introduce themselves shortly, uh, are uh, sponsoring and organizing this event. Um, we, this is one of a whole series of events we're holding in the course of this year. Last week, we discussed the Angolan situation uh, with elections also forthcoming there. In the autumn, we will be discussing the situation in South Africa and in Nigeria, um, uh, where again, elections are due next year. So it's uh, a, a fascinating series of events and we could not have a more star-studded and well-informed panel uh, with which to discuss this. So thank you all very much for joining us uh, online. We hope you can see and hear us clearly. Uh, and uh, I will now hand over to Agnes Gital from the East African Association to introduce our moderator and the association. Thank you all very much and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. So yes, you can all hear me. I'm just trying to get the right positions for the <laughs> online audience. Yeah, okay. I need to go a little bit now, but it's okay. Yes. yes. Oh. Great. Thank you very much, Nick, for working with us, GPS Africa and the East African Association to host, as you say, one of the most important elections in the Eastern African region. Kenya is a fairly stable economy, both politically and economically, and it's a very special country for us here in the UK, and I guess everywhere. And as usual, there's always a lot of focus on what will happen in Kenya, who is going to take place, and what will what are the uh, domestic dynamics and the regional the regional impact of this election. Our relationship with the Royal African Society dates back to 2007, I think, when I was a student, when we first discussed the very, very election, which for 2007, 2008, which nobody seems to forget. Everybody, particularly the international media, always, when you think about Kenya, you always refer back to the 2000 and 2008 election. As I said, uh, we, it's an important time for Kenya, and I am very delighted to welcome an excellent panel. Uh, all of them with a great interest in the country. And our moderator today is none other but, but Juliana Olayinka. She's a broadcast journalist and um, uh, political, political communication specialist. Juliana and a, <laughs> and a great friend of mine and a really great friend of, of the African region. Juliana and I worked on Nigeria decides and we've also covered a lot of other elections in the region. So thank you very much for joining us and particularly the online audience and those who are joining us, hopefully if they can make the, uh, through the heat this afternoon. Thank you, Juliana, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nick. Thank you, Agnes, and welcome everybody. I am Juliana Olayinka. I'll be your moderator. Um, apologies in advance if I'm annoying, um, but I'm here to feast upon everybody else's knowledge. Uh, before we introduce our stellar panel, um, just to remind you some housekeeping rules. Dr. Nick touched on it, um, but especially those online, those not in the UK, um, we are going through a heat wave and the government advice is to stay at home. We haven't listened to the government advice because this is an important discussion. Uh, so that's why um, our crowd is limited, but we can see that you're all here. And so we're really looking forward um, to taking your questions, please do write your questions in the chat Q&A uh, box. We will get to them. We are also going to throw out questions to our lovely audience. Yes, people have turned up. Um, and yes, that's how it's going to go. It's currently 5.25ish um, UK time. Um, this is going to run for about an hour. Um, it could be a little bit shorter, a little bit longer, but do uh, bear with us because this is an important discussion. Um, so without, okay, and if you're not speaking, please do put yourself on mute. 
Thank you very much. Although you may get an opportunity to speak afterwards. Um, but yes, please keep yourself on mute. So online, we have two individuals. First, we have Dr. Kenny Kariuki, a political economist with an agricultural and legal background, uh, the director of SKIO Network. He's an international consultant, tutor of understanding poverty and dissertation supervisor at SOAS University. We also have Samson Ochola. He'll be joining us online. He is a structural engineer working at North Sea Energy Company. He'll be joining us from Scotland. Um, right here to the left of me, I have Robin Gwynn. He is the joint owner and direct for, director of White Leaf Solutions Limited, um, providing consultancy services since 2014 on strategic and commercial opportunity and risk across Africa. Uh, next to Robin, um, we have John Mbiu. He is the chair of lobby group Kenya Movement for Democracy and Justice, founded in 1996. Uh, the movement was instrumental in supporting Kenya's multi-party politics. Um, he contested for a parliamentary seat in 2017 under the Safina party. Welcome to you. And next to John, we have Reginald Kuzutu, who is an economic and financial analyst, he is a financial econo economics PhD candidate at Oxford Brookes University, wow, uh, where he's also an associate lecturer. So um, we've got a really fab uh, panel and I'm going to dive right in. Um, time is limited, so please, please, please do keep um, your uh, statements brief and concise. There will be um, adequate time for you to follow up, uh, but I would like to give each and every uh, panel member um, an opening um, opportunity to answer the following question, which is the theme of why we're here. Kenya's general election, what's in play for the country? And I will start, please, um, with Dr. Kenny Kariuki. If you could please unmute yourself, Doctor. Thank you very much. I hope my internet connection is stable and you can hear me clearly. We can hear you perfectly. Fantastic. Uh, to the question, what is at stake? I would say, first of all, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, when it comes to what we're going to see in basically in August, what is at stake is, firstly, will the institutions hold? Um, the IABC is sort of getting scrutinized for some of its, pro its procurement. Um, we're going to see two major coalitions, as all my panelists will talk about, Azimio and Kenya Kwanzaa Alliance. <clears throat> and the question is, uh, will they accept the results? Uh, will the outcome be something that either side will accept? And I think we're going to do what we've done in the past. We're going to rely on our courts. Uh, through it all, uh, the courts have remained steady and have given us results. I think we can all say that um, as a Kenyan, at least I can say, uh, we're proud of uh, as an institution. Uh, beyond that, I think um, what is at stake is the constitution in terms of decentralization. Uh, one of the key propositions uh, that was brought, brought up by BBI was a change to that constitution. And now what we're going to be asking ourselves as Kenyans is, will that become a thing of the past or will it come back again? Um, also, we are going to see something that has been missed in the past. And uh, can you hear me? Everyone's very still in the picture. I just want to make sure. We, we can hear you. Can if we answer. can't, we will okay. we'll let you know. <laughs> Okay, fantastic. And then another thing that I think is critical to this election is simply um, what I would say a return to competitive politics in Kenya. I believe over the last five years from 2017, we, after the handshake and that I'm sure everyone is familiar with, with Uhuru Kenyatta and Raila Odinga, what occurred was the opposition and uh, the government formed an alliance uh, of, of some, kind of some sort of mutual interest and that essentially erased uh, or at least tempered any kind of notion of competitive politics where you found that now that since they were both on the same side, that a lot of the noise that we used to get from our MPs, a lot of the issues that were previously discussed weren't anymore. So despite who wins, because I know people support different sides, at least we're gonna see a split Senate, we're gonna see a split National Assembly, which I think is better for Kenyans because we get better, you know, we get things that are, shall I say, more tempered and be better discussed. Um, overall, I think 
and I feel that um, this election really s serves us an opportunity to see what happens when the mountain isn't involved. And by the mountain, I mean the Gemma community, as Gikuyu, Embu, and Meru peoples. So they're not included in this election. You will see the two running mates in the who front runners, shall I say, uh, Martha Karua and a man called Gishagwa. And the issue is, um, if you don't have the mountain actually participating and it's been split, who actually controls the mountain? And I think I can argue, or at least I can submit to my fellow panelists, that none of these two candidates, despite being Gikuyu, actually represent or hold the mountain in terms of being a kingmaker. So I think we also see, we'll see very, a very interesting dynamic in terms of, do we go with the status quo, i.e. Uh, Uhuru Kenyatta uh, representing essentially Azimio as a party chairman and a continuation of his agenda? Or do we move on with uh, William Ruto and we shall, off, you know, will that be something actually different? Is the testament bottom up actually going to be something we're going to see? And of course, then the final thing will be out of the six elections, will we have a runoff? Does anyone have 50 plus one? I think the polls are pretty clear that uh, no one has 50 plus one, but then of course, everyone's also said that the polls are completely, uh, uh, shall I say, they're not reproducing reality. So it's one, it's one of those things. So what is at stake? Uh, a lot. I think uh, our constitution and our way of decentralization and the progress we made over the last decade and also just uh, business as usual, or shall we take see a turn? And I think as finally as any other Kenyan would ask, is we've got an issue of debt, will that change with a new administration? I think I'll leave it there. I hope you guys heard most of the things I said. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Kenny. Very uh, concise uh, statement there. Um, a return to competitive uh, politics. I wonder if any of our panelists would, would agree with you. But before we ask uh, them that, let's also go to um, another um, online panelist, um, uh, Samson Ochola. Um, uh, what's at stake for the country? Uh, thank you, moderator. Uh, I hope I'm clear. Am I audible enough? Clear and audible. Thank you. Um, I'll take you from the previous speaker, Kenny. Uh, the coming election is a reset button for Kenya. Um, it's the third election under the new constitution. Uh, unfortunately, we have a presidential system, which is a, a cut and paste copy of the American system. Uh, it comes, it's a, it's a bittersweet uh, arrangement because it bestows uh, imperial powers still in the office of the presidency. And this makes the clamor for this uh, office uh, a race to the bottom, right? A race to the to the rock bottom of hell. The, 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 this it's a it's what you call a zero sum game to get the presidency, as Kenyans have experienced. However, uh, we have good stories that there is no make, there is no doomsday scenario at this election. I can clearly tell that because in Kenya there are five big communities, or rather the big five, as we have also the animals. For the first time, all those major players are found in both political camps. And namely, I can say the Kikuyus, the Kalenjins, the Luos, the Kambas, and the Luyas. In the two, within the two strong protagonists, the communities are found in both camps. So we are unlikely, therefore, to have the scenario of, uh, for example, 2007 or 2013, and even 2017, when there was a an escarpment, well, there was one side on the other, there was a block on the other side and a block on the other, and here was an escarpment. Uh, I can also say, summarize that um, the candidates who are running for the first time, the two frontline candidates, in follow up to what I've just said, they have a cross support. For example, all opinion polls could reasonably say that uh, both Raila Odinga and William Ruto can amaze 25% vote threshold in at least 40 counties across the country. We have 47 counties. And reasonably, each of them have at least a quarter of support. We have this constitutional threshold that for you to win the election, you must get 25% in at least half of our uh, semi-sovereign uh, territories called counties. So William Ruto, the incumbent deputy president and the challenger, both have spread support. This is 
critical for maintenance of peace because in the past, Mwai Kibaki probably won an election with a very skewed support from one region against all the other regions not supporting him. This is what results into what we had. Um, elections in Kenya, the Thank result you. of an, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll allow you to finish your point. I'll just quick it. Uh, before, in Kenyan situation, election result, there's a thin line between celebration and civil war. That's what we've had before. Everything comes to a standstill in 12 months leading to Kenyan election. No marriages, no investment, no nothing. But for the first time, owing to what I've just mentioned, there's hope that it will be a reconciliation election. Some people call it Mandela moment. So we are not going back to the past. We are going back to a threshold where we will accept the result. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. We'll be coming back to you shortly. Uh, let me bring it into uh, SOAS now. Um, uh, Reginald, uh, could you uh, address the point? Thank you. Um, what is at play? I, I think we, we have a country that is hanging on the ledge of an economic collapse. If you look at the macroeconomic fabric of the country, it is in tatters. So as much as people might be worried about, would there be a fallout because of who has lost, who has won, um, the person who's coming into power I even wonder why anyone wants to become president because the headache that they will have the first six months um, to just resuscitate, not even resuscitate, what do you call it? In, induce a coma on the economy so that it doesn't die is, is so huge. So let me give you an example. 80% of all revenue collected, um, and Kenya collects around 1.9 trillion uh, shillings in revenue. 80% of it goes to repaying debt, yeah? So any government that is coming into power has no money to do anything they are saying in their manifestos. And that is the truth of the matter, yeah? They will have no money to pay salaries. And that is the truth of the matter. They actually don't even have money to repay the same debt. Why? Kenyan Euro bond yields, I think among us one of the highest uh, right now. So they cannot borrow dollars to pay the Chinese uh, who we, 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 to pay the commercial loans to pay um, the Chinese. Fortunately, we don't print dollars, so we cannot rely on domestic borrowing to pay our external debt. Just looking at the external debt itself, um, our exports are a third of our imports. That means we are not generating enough money to even finance the imports that we have, let alone the debt um, that we have to, to, to pay. Apologies, Reginald. Uh, could, could you stay on mute, please, if you are tuning in via Zoom? Thank you. Sorry, please continue. Yeah. So th there is an economic crisis that has been muted or swept under the carpet um, for public relations uh, purposes. Um, Obviously, the IMF and the World Bank has a role to play uh, on that. The Kenya shilling has been depreciating. Uh, it was managed before central bank used to, to lie. They had a soft peg of uh, 100 shillings to, to the dollar, um, which they can't support um, anymore. So the, the first six months or the first one year of any government that is going to come in is not about bottom up, it's not about water, it's not about all these other things, it's about how do we keep the country ticking? How do we keep the economy from collapsing? Um, and unfortunately from reading the manifestos and hearing uh, mm -hmm. the, the main two front runners speaking, either they know and they don't want to admit or they actually just don't know, uh, which is the most worrying trend um, for me as an economist, because at the end of the day, um, you can be in power with a broken down economy, um, you will still end up having a civil war, Sri Lanka style. Right, okay, thank you, Reginald. I don't know if that's just a Kenyan thing or a global thing when it comes to the economies at the moment, because this kind of post pandemic, but we'll, we'll get there, sorry. Um, okay, and now we are going to be going to John, please, before we open this up. Uh, yes, what is on stake? Uh, everybody asked that. Um, even before when we fought for freedom, first independent, 
we were told we cannot manage ourselves. We cannot be able to run our country and our affairs, and we did. We had meltdown of economy before during the clamor for multi-party democracy and also the, the clamor for constitutional uh, advance. Because what happened during that time, the people who were our allies and who thought the people who are calling for multi-party democracy cannot govern well, <clears throat> govern well, they withdraw the foreign aid. Which part of us was good because it was going to the dictator, like any other country, and we know what happened, mismanagement of the economy of 90s. Everybody knows that there was what you call siphoning of public coffers from all of Africa back to the West. Loans which were supposed to come and help Africans did not help Africans. It helped the, country, the Western countries. And part of that, when we left Kenya, when we were fighting for multi party democracy, when there was no that freedom of association or freedom of speech or of press, we came to exile. And when we came to exile, our first responsibility is to caution the government. Those who are in the Canada were questioning the Canadian government. Those who are in America were questioning America everywhere. Why do you keep sustaining bad governance in our country by giving them aid, diplomatic, uh, um, uh, or, 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 or what you call security um, uh, relations, which favor them and which do not favor them, the country itself? And there was another worry that what's, what's happened next if we give you multi party democracy? There's going to be a civil war, the, uh, the economy will fail. And we proved we got the multi party, and Kenya became one of the country, shining country in Eastern Africa. Because don't forget that Kenya is the hub to the Central Africa. And before those are far away from us in the Western countries or wherever, the people who should be complaining first are our neighbors, because we rely more on them than Western countries. And we know one of our first. Um, investor in Kenya is Uganda. You have never heard Uganda say, oh, there is election in coming in Kenya, uh, we, we're gonna collapse, the East Africa gonna collapse. No, it doesn't. So what is in stake is that it's progressive politics in Kenya. If you look this election, the DP started campaign four years ago. He never performed as a DP. The electoral rules favored him because if it was UK, he'd be disqualified or elsewhere because there is no level playing with others because others just started the three months ago. And you could see he could not be arrested. You have never seen him tear gassed because he's doing that campaign. That shows how mature Kenya has become economically and politically. So what is in stake is progressive politics and Kenya is gonna prevail. Let us go back to 2002, when Moi was dislodged from power. Krama to that, to that year, investors were holding investment. They were saying Moi is going, we don't know what's gonna happen. Let us hold and see what happens. What happened, there was a very peaceful election Moi had an overpower. We inherited minus six, negative six economy. And then we inherited civil service that was morally dead, you know? Morally, people who could not function. President Kibaki had to go and bring military in so that the government could function. And within one year, this is in record, our economy was appreciating, was having surplus, we are plus six growth. So what is in stake now? People are talking about borrowing, mm. over borrowing. Uh, the government gonna collapse. It's the responsibility of Kenya government is collapsing. Oh, look at here, how, how is the economy here in UK? We probably, that's a good, it's a good uh, note to, to, to change our, our speaker. We're gonna come back to you, John, because you've, you've 
you know, there's loads of um, yeah, let me go. cans of words you've opened there. But yes, just finish your point and then we'll let move me, on. Let me finish. So what is on the stake is that we're going to have a peaceful election. The election is going to come. Whoever win, will win. Whoever lose, you lose. If you go to the Supreme Court, you have one of the best. We saw in 2017, you'll be given a fair trial. The, 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 the election uh, will be checked where there are malpractices or it was a free will and will prevail. That's, that's the hope. Thank you so much, John. Uh, can I just remind um, our audience on Zoom, please do write your questions in the chat box. We really do want to speak to all of you. So please do that. Um, I'll pass on now to Robin. Great. Thank you very much, Juliana. And thank you to the hosts for inviting me. Um, Thank you also to my panelists. They've already given, I think, begun to sort of uh, delve into the detail and analysis of the current process. So I think for me, I'm going to try and answer your question by standing back slightly and taking a slightly longer term perspective on the opportunities and risks that there are for Kenya through this election and perhaps some of the regional and international implications as well. Um, the context for me, I'm not sure whether to admit this after what John's just said, but um, the earlier part of my career was spent as a British diplomat uh, in and around Africa. Africa, and my first posting was in Nairobi in the run-up to the 1992 elections. Mm -hmm. um, and as the junior, uh, most junior reporting officer, my job was to keep in touch with the, the newly legitimised opposition. So various people like Raila Odinga and others' names were all uh, setting out on their political careers. And in one case, there was a lady called Martha Karua, who was a young uh, DP, uh, a lawyer from Kiambu in Mwai Kibaki's party. And it took me some time, I think, to persuade her to actually meet British government. But when, when we did meet, um, I realized I was actually kind of on the menu. She gave me a very long grilling about British government policy, probably sympathized, um, which I've remembered. But my point is that, of course, a lot of the, even the current actors have been around for a long time. And I think the talk in the 1990s, particularly from new politicians was that when we come to power things will be different in Kenya and I think some of them have had that opportunity along the way and some of them are coming around again but it may be that the outcomes of this election allow that if you like that promise to be fulfilled that things really can be done differently. Um, I just want to pick up two main underlying uh, trends as I said. Um, first of all I think just just from what Samson was saying earlier of course the focus of our discussion and everything seems to be on the presidential level all the time but in reality I think there are six different levels of election going to happen. Um, for long-term underlying change I think it's important to try and track whether a different type of candidate is coming through the system including at parliamentary level. You John may be an example of this uh, and um, I think I'm right in saying in 2017 for example there were there were some really interesting MPs that came through the system I'm not sure they made much impact since but change is often a long-term generational thing and there were people who approached the job of MP different to being the honourable member and actually were were I think travelling to work on matatus and you know making a name for themselves as people who wanted to make a difference in the country so maybe below the presidential focus we'll see some of that happening. Um, added to that I think a second factor which again I think we've touched on already is whether there really will be a breakdown or a rearrangement in the kind of ethnic block voting, if I can use that term, that we, of course, has defined Kenyan elections for since forever. Um, maybe it was a result of multi-partyism, maybe not. We can talk about that, but it's a fact that it's happened. And so the question is whether there are new, there are clearly new electoral dynamics in play through the party tickets, even at this election. But will they lead in future, perhaps combined with new, a new type of politician coming through the system, to future candidates perhaps standing across the current divides on maybe more on policy issues rather than um, what's determined parties and allegiances to date? Um, dare I say it, there may be a little bit of an echo of Nigeria here. We mentioned Nigeria with Peter Obi, Governor Obi there, attracting a youth vote in Nigeria across the current political divides. Maybe it won't happen this election, but maybe there's something stirring there for the future. Could so could happen. Um, if I may, just quickly on to risks. Um, Kenny, I think, mentioned already the importance of a credible election, electoral process. In a sense, not just 
the uh, winners and losers accepting the result, but the result itself being credible to be able to be accepted, if I can put it that way. And I think those of us who've been involved in Kenya over the years know that that was a particular problem, of course, in 2007, eight, even in 2017. So the performance of the IEBC is very much under scrutiny. And I think we probably all have some concerns about where that where that is at the moment secondly i don't think we've mentioned climate the drought the global food supply shocks they're not necessarily a direct impact maybe they are in some of the campaigning but particularly um in the context of a drawn out electoral process other rounds and so on that could be begin to become factors we can talk about. Finally, I said, if I may, I'll just mention the regional situation. Again, I think there is a lot at stake for Kenya in the region. Um, under the present uh, current president, Kenyatta, Kenya has, I think, deliberately raised its profile in a mediating role, in a convening role in the region. Um, I heard that the if there are peace talks to go ahead between the government of Ethiopia, the federal government, and the Tigrayan front, that could take place in Nairobi. Kenyan government's already very well um, organized on, on DRC, Eastern DRC, and making, um, uh, talking to the new government in Somalia. So a lot at stake there. And of course, remember, Kenya is still on the UN Security Council till the end of this year. So again, there's global issues at stake there, which Kenya is a, is a player in. Um, and finally, um, I suppose the question again, subject to what Reginald said about what is a really difficult economic intray for the new uh, president and government, I, I feel it's some way, I think both um, regional and international, well, outside Africa governments, and maybe even investors um, have priced in to some extent, the kind of pause that happens during a Kenyan election period, of course they have, and possibly even some dislocation, though I agree and we all hope there won't be any of that. Um, but that's for a limited period. So I think, you know, the region, the, the world really needs Kenya to come back on the stream quite quickly after the electoral process, if I can put it that way, subject to the risks that we're um, highlighting. And finally, 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 on that note, yeah. I did say again... I think you're getting favouritism, Robert. OK, and, and John, John prompted me to say this again. I think it's a kind of shout out for kind of messy democracy in Kenya. You know, we've got a bit of that going on in the UK at the moment as well. And it's easy to kind of look at a country and say, what's going on? This is all chaotic, etc. But actually, underlying that, I think for those of us who, who love Kenya over the years, it's kind of been a constant kind of frustrating and amazing how the electoral process has delivered ongoing growth and progress maybe it could have been much faster but it is happening and um let's hope that the what's to come next month is another step on that road here here thank you so much robin thank you everybody we've touched on some uh, really important points the economy climate food security um progressive politics multi-party uh, politics all really important we do have a couple of questions coming in before we get to our online questions and our audience questions I do want to kind of put three questions in one if I can and again apologies but really brief concise responses if I can um, we will start with our um, online um, guests our panelists online um, Dr Kenny and Samson can we talk a little bit about policy and political ideology, which for some reason we, we shy away from in Africa, um, but some people do want a really simple answer. You know, what are the options facing people at the ballot? ballot? If you vote for this person, what are you going to get? If you vote for him, what are you going to get that's different? That's first of all, really important to include social media as well. We know that Africa in particular, so much misinformation, fake news is spread there. Are you concerned about that? Especially because we know lots of this information can lead to huge violence. And uh, lastly, I do want to talk about political apathy um, because voter turnout um, is dwindling. Um, a lot of people were expecting there to be a little bit more fireworks. You know, this is Kenya we're talking about, a major powerhouse, not really getting that. Even if you look in the Western press, you're getting bits and pieces of, um, you know, articles, but not what we would expect, you know, the correspondence on the ground, talking about the build-up. So apologies that that's three and one, but so really ideology, what are we going to get um, at the ballot box? 
social media are we are we concerned about this and um political apathy and we will start please uh, with dr kenny and we'll bring that in and then we'll bring in our audience thank you very much for the question uh, i'll try to be as concise as possible uh, when it comes to ideology i think we really have to look at why and how kenyans vote historically people like bratton and kameni have had papers out about uh, voting in Kenya and the reasons why Kenyans vote. People say it's tribe, it's about service delivery, some people talk about association, but the reality is um, constituency. Uh, Kenya, like many countries on the continent, uh, the way we manage uh, and the way we choose politicians isn't based upon ideas or ideology per se from, maybe shall I say that Western microscope, it's actually based upon where are you from? We, we vote in constituency in terms of geography. Yes, there are some issue-based politicians. I won't take that away. But on the end of the day, if you vote because someone is from Kirinyaga or someone is from, uh, shall I say, Kiambu, that's who you're voting for. You're voting for the geography. And then the person may come with ideas. However, we also have great, we have coalitions. And yes, independent candidates may come in here and there. However, the coalitions are sometimes are so strong and so pervasive that if you're not part of that coalition, it's unlikely that you'll end up actually winning the ballot. So when I come to ideology, I'll definitely say we have the manifestos, they look good. However, yeah, everyone on the panel and people in the audience will know what we had a big four agenda and that was tied very closely to something called the Huduma number. Uh, after essentially a decade, we don't have any of the big four achieved. Uh, there was no better housing. There was no food security. I can say that manufacturing is exactly where it was and you can blame COVID and, and anything else when it comes to that. Uh, and I can talk about universal health care, but I'm not going to go into it. So when it comes to ideo ideology, I think the, the real politic on the ground and isn't so much about ideology. I think we really have an issue where people want certain needs, basic needs, service delivery achieved. Uh, there comes to a point where, I listen to your third question, when it comes to political apathy, um, there is the issue of, is this always going to be the same? Do we get the same results? And I think when we look at the IEBC registration that we had earlier, people this year felt that, wow, the youth aren't registering, people aren't coming out. We don't, we're not hitting the numbers with, to be expected in terms of a whole like drive to get new voters for this next uh, election. And I think there is a little bit of apathy because like uh, it was mentioned by my colleague on the panel, some of these gentlemen and wonderful women in politics have been around for a very long time. And on, you begin to see the same faces and the same names and that this issue of, is this just a political dynasty? And truly in Kenya, there, there are two tribes, the people who are in the political class and the people who are not. And so the issue is with how the optics of the political class, and that is the attraction, I think, around uh, Kenya Kwan where yes we have some of the same old and no one can say they are you know they're outsiders because they were all part of Kanu since at some point in their careers however the reality is I don't think it's more so much political apathy I think it's more to do with this election season has been protracted uh, as mentioned by one of my fellow panelists uh, William Ruto began campaigning a bit early and I won't fault him for that uh, just on the basis that uh, the handshake and the, shall I say, un the messy divorce that occurred within Jubilee uh, almost, uh, this is to say, um, propelled him to have to act. And his actions were within the constitution, within his right. He began to campaign. And of course, the law may not have a mechanism for that. But that is, I think, why people are a bit tired. We've been literally in, in a campaign mode for the last almost two years. So I think Ken, even when you watch any news, if you watch the news today and tomorrow, it's uh, we, we like the message, but it's the same message and we're ready to go vote. Um, and the last thing on social media. Yes, are we lastly, concerned? thank you, Dr. Kenny. Lastly, yes, I'll let I'll, you finish. I apologize. Uh, on the last thing, I think, are we concerned about the issues of social media? I think there's enough policing. There's enough, uh, Kenyans are vigilant enough. KOT is vigilant enough. Definitely you will see things uh, in terms of, of Shall I say smear campaigns, you will hear about certain politicians doing certain things. However, at this point, because it's something that is known, that there are issues within social media that can arise, I think people also take it with a pinch of salt. So personally, I would say, yes, there are issues, but nothing that is alarmist. Now I'll leave it there. Thank you. Oh, ever an optimist. Thank you, Dr. Kenny. Really insightful. Um, Sam? Thank you, Chase. 
a quick one. I'll start with the voter apathy. Um, I'll follow up to what Robin said. Yes, there will be a voter apathy generally in Kenya, basically because of the issues of climate change, drought, food shortages, and uh, energy crisis. These things are overwhelming on citizens and they're more preoccupied with the, these challenges than the desire to come out and vote. So yes, there will be a, a voter apathy relatively, especially in the Asal region, that is the semi-arid regions of Kenya, places like Turkana and the Northern Frontiers. I, there's a lot of drought and issues of food security and uh, that will definitely have an impact on election. Uh, secondly, the reason for apathy is because of what we call deja vu, that in the past Kenyans have never seen a credible outcome, which can be verifiable. So this has made most people to really see what's the point of it. We know the outcome. That's on voter apathy. Uh, thank you. Ask about uh, policies and manifestos. I wish there was a policy dividing line. However, most of it is actually packaging and the semantics. There is very little policy, thin dif there is a thin policy difference between the two camps. Both of them have universally agreed that there will be more money to the, uh, to the devolved governments away from Nairobi. Um, that's a universally agreed thing. And um, again, just going back to apathy issue, the Kenyans feel that the elected leaders are more like greedy. They're earning a lot of salaries. Unlike the past, maybe when Robin met the likes of Martha Karo in 1992, when an MP was really a servant of the people. Today, in spite of their increased remunerations, the, the delivery, there's no value for money generally in the legislative affairs of the country. Um, finally, on policy, uh, William Ruto has something called you know, uh, bottom up. Raila has some corrupted version called uh, of Obamacare. These are just semantics, but both of them have uh, agreed that money should be uh, money should be taken more to the grassroots. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Sam. I think we do have a couple of questions from um, our audiences for you, so do stay around um, for us. Let me just pass this back into uh, the panel, Reginald. If you can pick up for us. I, I think on policy, we actually need to. Um, I know that two panelists have dismissed policy, but we are in the mess we are in because of policy. Uh, 2013, uh, Jubilee then, was it called Jubilee? I don't know what they were called then, um, had a policy. And that policy led them to borrow ridiculously so that they implement their policy. So we should never discount policy because they actually come in and try and implement that policy. Um, and the mess that we are in right now is because of ridiculous economic policies which are not related to the structure of the economy. So right now we are saying, yes, they've both agreed they want to put more money to, to the counties. Um, devolution in Kenya was done for political expediency with no economic analysis done on it. There are some counties which just don't make sense. There are counties which are smaller than a constituency in Nairobi. So it doesn't make sense to have a whole county government uh, which an MP in Nairobi in Dakureti South has three times the amount of people that, um, th that they have. So policy, I think, is very important and people need to actually look at it, um, especially these two policies that are there. Um, bottom up, fancy word, doesn't exist. Um, read the manifesto, it's just throwing money at any problem or anything that bugs through 250 billion, this bucks another 250 billion. And you wonder how are they going to finance all this back into the same debt trap? Social media in Kenya, let's be honest, it has no impact. 70% of the people stay in rural areas, don't have Twitter accounts. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of noise on social media, it will not affect two or 3% of the votes. I'll give you an example, Peter Kenneth in 2018 was leading on Twitter polls. Yeah, his following even went to above a million. He didn't even get 40,000 votes when the date for voting came. So social media is there. Yes, people make noise, shout at each other. Fake news? Violence? I, I think if, if, if you use element of fake news, Kenyans have become a bit smarter because the internet doesn't forget, um, which I think in this case, the deputy president kind of forgets because all the time he's mentioning something, people get a clip of something that he said and play it back to him. Yeah, like the port in Mombasa, 
uh, it was played back to him. His promises that he made in 2018, we're gonna build a stadium in six months, people asking him, so why should we trust you now? And every promise you made 2018, 2017, nothing has been fulfilled. You know, it doesn't often just trust me, I've changed, I've changed. But the guy has been promising. So in terms of fake news, it's literally debunked uh, very, very, very quickly. Voter apathy, well, uh, I think it will affect one, one of the candidates who was hoping that the youth would turn up to vote. The statistics from IBC show that uh, 60 to 65 percent of all the voters are aged uh, uh, 35 years and above. And the older people know who William Ruto is and who Raila Odinga is. Uh, you cannot lie to those people. They were there during post-election violence. They were there during Moyes' time. So that voter apathy is actually more on the young voters. And, and I'm worried when people say that um, there's voter apathy because there is hunger, uh, like one of the panelists has said. That should actually wake you up to go and vote to make sure you get a government that sorts out this problem. But if you decide you're not going to vote because you are hungry, you're going to be hungry for the next five years. Really fascinating points. Could I say controversial? I love it. <laughs> Let's now go on to John. Thank you. I think over the years, um, the policy of political parties in Kenya have failed because they don't tackle corruption. Mm. Because our major obstacle to development to good economy is corruption. First, there was a time recently, President said that uh, Kenya was losing two billion a day to corruption. And that, and that is true. And the, why we have the corruption continuing is because we have inability court, a court that does not convict the corrupt people when anti-corruption take them to the court. The cases drag on, drag on, drag on for years and years. There are cases that were taken to court during more time and they are still in court. Let me give you an example. Some of us who were tortured, they took the government to court, 2002. To, to date, those people have never been paid. And the court have said these people should be paid for, for torture. But because the court goes around and around to play the game with the corrupt individuals, that's why even the political party to make uh, a good governance is hard economically. So what we have to do is to deal first with the court, because if the court cannot deliver uh, fair justice to the people, because corrupt people are being taken to court for the, for the people to get fair, fair justice for their coffers. Um, I can give you an example. Recently, the anti-corruption gave 241 people, individuals, from the board coalition who should not vie because these people have corrupt cases with the anti-corruption. There are other things uh, regarding the integrity issue. What does the court go do? The court just go and let them, let them run. The cornerstone of any country is the judiciary. Where the judiciary fail, even the government fails. And the president have said that. There are people wanted by Americans um, for trafficking the drugs for decades, for decades. Those people could not be extradited because the court was preventing them from being extradited. And it was proven the courts were being paid by them, by cartels, not for these people to be extradited. And the FBI, what did the FBI do? They just went and set these people to another deal so that they could be able to arrest him. And they say the rest we want, we cannot be able to get them with the current setup of the government in Kenya. And that's why I say um, the BBI was very important for Kenya. Although the, because it was not started constitutionally, it was very important because one of the articles on the BBI, what they, they are trying to do is to audit all the civil servants, including the, the judges. And that's why you could see that the judges had a fight with the state that the BBI doesn't sail through because they know they are part of that. So there is no policy that we can say this party doesn't have a policy. It is because of the epidemic of corruption that make them not to be able to run. Another important thing that I could make, which you mentioned, is about the, the counties. We don't have a county that's more like 
one constituency. All the counties have got like six, seven constituencies, very which are very large. You don't have a county that is size of a constituency. You know, people there must think that uh, there is one county in Kenya that is getting an expenditure of money because it's a constituency. No, and the devolution have really helped. Those people who have been going up country, the devolution have really helped. Although there is corruption going on, there is a lot of in schooling, uh, um, health, infrastructure, and macro finances that are really helping people to do small businesses. So the other one was uh, media, the role of media. We have a free media in Kenya. These social media you see around, people don't take them serious. The propagandas you can they, they put the DP doing this or Raira doing this. People just rough, but that will not make them change their vote, or how they are going to vote. They know these are just propagandas going around. Everybody knows that. Even small children know that. So that's social media aspect. It's interesting, actually. <laughs> yeah. It would be it would be great if we had a wider audience so we could take a poll because it appears as if a lot of people are discounting social media, and it's just simply not true. Social media is is, no, no, is it, a vehicle that's used. It is a vehicle, but they know when it is propaganda and when it is not propaganda. Right. As he said, like like I think <laughs> like it, I think the DP is the one who is really being touched by the by the social media because. He fight his own government when he was making policies some years back, and now he's fighting and he's shown that this is what you said at that time, and this is what you are telling at that time. That one is a correction, which is very good. But there are other things that they exaggerate that people don't take serious, uh, to be honest. So, I think. Well, yes. Okay. I'll let you. I'll let you finish. Um, yeah, John, so, and then we'll. So what, what I would like to say is that um, if any political party have to have an agenda their first agenda is to fight in corruption. And I guess I think this election, if Azmi win this election, they are carrying that as one of their major uh, agenda, yes. to fighting and tackling corruption. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, John. Okay, finally to uh, Robin, and then we will throw it over uh, to the, the audience. Thanks, Julian. I'll be very quick on your three questions. I'll try and add something to the, all the excellent comments colleagues have made. Um, on policy, um, I would say, I think, that in a sense, I can identify at least one gap where policy could be um, for any particular party or candidate, which is on the business investment side. Um, the from the point of view of someone who's advising companies on investing into Kenya, it's not the whole answer for the Kenyan economy, but I think it's a fact to say that there would be much more investment where there was a business and a uh, conducive economy to receive the investment that people actually want to put into Kenya. So corruption is definitely part of that, as John says, but it's actually about more basics as well. Forex exchange rates, registering companies, land tenure, you know, things that boards of companies want to know before they put their money into a country. And when they do that, it will create jobs and growth and so on. So I think all of the candidates could probably say more about that. Um, False news, again, I think, as colleagues have said, one of the huge strengths of, I think, Kenyan democracy over the years is that very vibrant, first of all, media, now social media scene. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to agree with you. I'm sure people can see through, in a yeah. sense, what's happening. Mm -hmm. I hope that's true. Of course, there's been massive problems in the past um, where that hasn't happened, maybe even recently. Mm -hmm. So, But on the whole, it's part of that underlying strength, I think, um, and long may it continue in Kenya. Um, and hopefully spread around the region uh, as well. Finally, on um, political apathy, I think we all know it's not a good sign when people stop voting, usually for negative reasons. Um, you and I, Juliana, we were talking before we, the panel started about the concept of accountability, you know, that people need to uh, know and believe that they can change their leaders if they don't think they've done a good job. Um, and I think to the extent that we can establish that through democratic elections or whatever, that will, it'll be a long process, but it should help to um, uh, improve credibility in the process and bring people back to vote. So for me, accountability is always um, the key attribute that um, we're looking for. Thank you. 
thank you all so much. Apologies that I've tried to condense your um, opinions. Um, testament that we need to do this again, if not before, certainly after, to kind of debrief and relax and talk about it all. Um, I, how do you want to do this? Do we go online first or should we take it from our audience inside? What would you prefer? Yeah, okay. Um, should we take some online questions? Okay, we will do that. Uh, let me just go here to my chat box right somebody's asking uh, you guys to host host the uh, presidential candidates <laughs> and hear about their policies can you put that in for us that would be great um okay so we've got a question here from a roman mazur just wondering about real world groups of voters never heard about anything specific from them non-candidate has anything real to offer to them. On the other hand, we have a huge lack of teaching force in the EU. Nobody thinks about building ed tech bridges, which is now very easy. In Kenya, while they would be able to work remotely, most of the EU's secondary schools are oh, not sure. I understand that point. Uh, whilst I, if you could please rewrite that question for us. There's a question here. Uh, from Kezia Orege, why can't we have live debate? Okay, this is the same uh, question about the presidential um, candidates. So whilst we get those questions from the online audience up, is there somebody in the audience here that would like to ask a question? Yes, please, if you could uh, tell us your, your full name and title and who you're directing that question towards, thank you. Um, I don't think I have anybody in particular I'm directing it to anyone who would like to take it. So my question is, what's the strength of the voice of the Kenyan youth during this period? And um, is there an, a, an availability of options um, in the sense that there are other people who could sway the opinion of the crowd? Why I'm saying this mm. is because um, I heard what Robin was saying um, from Nigeria and the whole thing with the Nigerian youth for the first time in my life, I'm seeing something I've never seen before. So that even the whole social media absence and all of that, I know a lot of youth who have gone into rural areas, we're seeing it online and they're educating people who cannot read about mm. um, politics and all of that. So is there a voice, you know, which, you know, a group of people who are able to do something different, you know, with innovation, with them? Um, I don't know how long it is to the Kenyan elections. Um, we have um, next month. Sorry, next month. Oh, it's next. Oh, okay, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, is there still, you know, a pot potential for another force, you know, rising in Kenyan politics? Thank you. Yeah, I'm think. Are we should we take them all from the audience and then bring them back? Yes, because we are. I think we've probably got about five minutes. Have we. Thank you, Nick Westcott. I'd like to ask the panelists, what will make the key difference for the swing voters mm. in uh, around Mount Kenya? Uh, you identified earlier, this is a key constituency, which way is it gonna split? What will make the difference for them? Thank you. Um, I just want to ask, a lot of it is made up about the fact that we have a very strong judiciary or not so strong in certain areas, but we are coming into probably the third election cycle where each election has been challenged and there's been some issue that has had to go to the courts every time. I was starting to now reach the point where if this also goes to the courts, the next one goes to the courts and so on, regardless of whether or not they overturn them. I was starting to reach a point where almost having too much of a reliance on the courts rather mm. than just free flowing good elections that people are able to accept means that we stop trusting our elections entirely. Because there is no way to run a perfect election, is there? There will be one indiscrepancy. Someone will fail to read a number correctly. Something small will go wrong. And so if every tiny thing becomes a reason to run an election, are we then not running into a dangerous period where we just never trust any of them that come around? Or is it a good thing that we can continuously run to the courts? It's a good question. I, I am just about the age of candidates and whether that might be putting the youth of voting. Um, I, I read this book, North to Paradise, yesterday by Usman Umar, who's a migrant who goes from Ghana up to Spain. And he talks about, in his village, uh, you always go to the elders because they know everything. And I was thinking, in an illiterate society, that's absolutely right, because hmm. they've been around for 60 or 70 years, and there's no other way to gain knowledge. But today, whether it's in Nigeria, the youth can have so much more knowledge than many of the elders, or probably in Kenya. And I know the literacy rate's higher in Kenya, but still. And I just wonder whether that, how long you think that cultural, quite correct cultural attitude 
will, will actually change as a result of the youth being better educated than their parents. Right. Uh, my question is about the, uh, the issue of the historical uh, land issues. I think is the I think uh, is the high time now that some of these issues are being sorted out, because like uh, some of us are very young, and uh, I remember during the Nyao era, especially early 1990s, so some of these issues came up all the time. It was during that uh, Wakatua, well, uh, during the first multi-party elections, and uh, and uh, I remember one of my uncles got just away. So I think for us young people, we need uh, uh, they need this issue of uh, land to, to be sorted out. Uh, otherwise, uh, well, I don't want like uh, Kenya to be, uh, to go into like a situation whereby some people are thinking of taking arms into their own arms. Like uh, for example, like uh, what happened, like in like in uh, like in uh, Zimbabwe, or maybe even the way uh, somebody in South Africa is thinking, uh, like I've been talking about uh, somebody called uh, uh, somebody called uh, Malema. So, the, so the issue of land has to be sorted out because as young people, we uh, we are tired. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so so thank you. So I'm, I'm going to throw that out to the panel, um, and we will take one question online because we are running. Um, we're, we're running two time, but out of time. Please, um, panelists, if you could just focus on one of the questions. So we're talking about: Is there anything that can swing the youth vote? Youth participation, the judiciary system, and challenging the results, trust in the election process age of candidates we have the same issue in nigeria <laughs> um and historical uh, land issues are these being taken as seriously um well this time we'll start here and then we'll go back to our online so we'll start with robin thanks juliana um yeah i'm going to try to answer something around the youth vote um a couple of questions on that um i mean the these are really exciting themes, I think, because um, for me, where the change will really come, and this is even outside Africa, is when the electorate in any given country is given the chance to express a free and fair opinion, and where, they're, where they have candidates where they can have a genuine choice, and where they choose candidates who are going to do things differently. So for in a sense, you want an electorate to say, if you want to be leader of our country, you can no longer carry on doing things the old way. And we want we demand you know greater competence greater probity whatever uh, there's a kind of version of this perhaps happening in the uk at the moment but i mean i think that's the core process that we're looking for and so um as i said earlier that plays into the current kenyan electoral context if there are really um opportunities ahead for people to vote differently to forget where this particular leader comes from um or even who he's in alliance with he it is he at the moment um, but and to think, well, actually, are they doing a good job? Um, what's their record in government? I should vote for them for that reason. So there's a whole lot in there, but I think there is some hope. And the country where it's happened a bit is Zambia. You all know the president, Hichilema, appealed through social media, through his accounts, to the youth vote. And they went with him. And I think, and he's promising some of the kind of things I was talking about earlier, good, conducive environments and so on. Whether he will deliver or not is over to him. Thank you, but, Robin. you know, that's that's a sign of... A good direction of travel, I think. Thank you. Uh, John, could you pick up on one of those questions, please? I'll go about the, the courts, um, about the people taking the petition to the court, um, the presidential candidates. I think there was a reform that was done immediately after 2017 election that was nullified. And they will have to look at the merit. We just, just take the case for the sake of it, of grading the process. They have to check the merit before they accept there is a credible challenge, and then to throw it out. That, that, that's one of the things. That, can I mention about the injustice, um, about the land injustice? Briefly, um, please. Thank you, John. Yeah, there is what is called uh, um, truth and and truth, truth and um, TJ, T, T, TJRC um, Commission, which actually it has 
worked very well about all the injustice that there, were, there have been big people trying to stop it from coming out. And that is one of the promise that the writer has promised that when he become the president, that is one of the issues that he's gonna deal with first so that the, the, the land distribution in Kenya can be checked. Okay, that, that's a policy policy there. <laughs> let's, let's move on um, to Reginald, please. Thank you. Um, so, so briefly, um, one, the youth need to understand politics is a science and a career. You don't wake up three months to an election and you want to be elected. People need to know you uh, everywhere. So you don't think because you are famous on TikTok, 40% uh, <laughs> of the voters who are in the rural areas who don't no know. No more social is. media bashing, please. Yeah. TikTok. So, 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 so if the youth want to get into leadership, politics like medicine, engineering, and all that stuff is literally a career. Um, and you have to work uh, work on it, walk the, the, the walk, go down to the grassroots uh, and all. And for Africa, for youths also to rise up, I think we need to be strict on legislation on campaign financing. Um, the deputy president has been campaigning for four years. Imagine the amount of money that he has spent in those four years. Uh, a young person won't be able to, to, uh, to do that. Uh, when it comes to elections being challenged every time in court, it goes to the strength of the institutions. Um, when we have a credible, independent electoral boundaries commission, then we can start having people saying, okay, I accept the results. But in this case, we have a commission that the last election, they had uh, 1,400 uh, places where 4G did not work. This year, again, two months to the election, I'm saying, yeah, those places are still there. We need to find a solution for, I'm thinking, but you had four years to fix the problem. You have not fixed the problem. Uh, they were told to open the server in the last elections. Up to now, we don't even know where that server is. Uh, and so that's why you end up having people going to court because you just can't trust uh, these guys. So strength of institutions will make us move from there. Thank you so much, Reginald. We'll, we'll post a selfie on TikTok after this. Um, okay, uh, let me, let's speak to uh, Samson, please, briefly, please, because we are running out of time and I do want to take at least one question from online. I'll just, I'll comment on Mount Kenya swing vote. Uh, there is unlikely to be a major shift three weeks left to the election. The reality is that um, there's a trajectory of Raila Odinga increasing his gains, and Ruto, who started from the high, highest margin, going down. Mount Kenya vote was split in 1992, 65-35, between uh, Matiba Kibaki. Also, Mount Kenya vote was split in 2002, roughly two to three on the other side. Uh, this time was uh, Kibaki Uhuru. And uh, there is a likelihood that we'll have that two-thirds vote split again, where William Ruto retains 65% of Mount Kenya and Raila Odinga gets 35%. The only difference is that Raila stands to gain and probably win by that 35% vote share of Mount Kenya, where he got nearly zero, less than 7%. Uh, in quantification, it could be about 1.5 million vote, more votes that Raila Odinga gets in Mount Kenya. As long as he stabilizes his farmer regions, that would be probably enough to you know, keep it on the finishing line. Um, to end that, Mount Kenya will be looking at the shortest route to return back to power. And uh, there's a feeling that William Ruto will be another Mugabe, strong man who could rule there and even change the constitution and be there forever, as opposed to the conventional belief that Raila is a transitional president. So probably they will cast their lot with the Raila presidency, all factors equal. God, Sam, that uh, answer has led to so many questions. Um, yes, we definitely need a part two of this discussion. Um, and very uh, lastly, Dr. Kenny, are you still with us? Yes, I'm still here. Uh, thank you very much for your comments, guys. Uh, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> when it comes to this, I think everyone's touched on everything. I would say that when it comes to youth in Kenya, it's hard to say that there's actually been any conclusive study on the impact of the youth in terms of their voter share. However, I still go back to why do people vote in Kenya? And it still sits on the same same things. Uh, it'll go to tribe, it'll go to certain needs and wants. So it's very hard to actually map that. When it comes to 
uh, 50 plus one in the current polls that have been done and Mount Kenya's role, I, I really appreciate the, the comments that were made. However, I still believe at least from what, and, or what has been put out and what historically that we might probably have a runoff. Uh, will it go to court? Likely. However, we understand that there is a candidate who's more likely to bring it to court, and that is a candidate that has been currently saying with his deputy that the IEBC has not done enough. Why is there no manual voter register, which you should have both, not just an electronic one? Uh, some valid points, but I believe if um, Kenya Kwanza were to prevail, I don't believe or to lose, uh, they won't be bringing up issues in court. And uh, to the comments made about the courts themselves being weak, I think, if anything, especially with the BBI process, I'm not too sure how the panelists feel about the BBI process, but that was the one time in Kenya, I can definitely say, or at least shall I say since 2017, when we saw the court annul the presidential election, that we saw the courts standing up where the Senate failed, where the National Assembly failed, and where MCAs essentially were bribed with a car loan uh, to make a make it in the grant, where they actually stood up and said, this is actually an unconstitutional process. It wasn't not only the High Court, the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court. So I understand the issues with the land, but those issues with the land sometimes are also political. I find that sometimes it's, it's remiss to just say the courts aren't working. Um, most times it is the fact that the courts uh, have their hands tied because of certain issues. I don't believe we have a bankrupt judiciary. In fact, I find that if we look at the last 20 years, they, they made fantastic strides. As for, I know I'm only meant to answer one question. I'm just going to yeah. answer the Thank question. you. So thank you, thank you uh -huh. Dr. Kelly. We have, uh -huh. we, have, we have so many questions that have come in online and um, I, I must at least take one of them because it would be awful for me not to. Um, we, we can only have one answer, I'm afraid. Um, so I'm just going to throw it, throw it out to the panel here um, in SOAS, um, because I think this is a really important question. How do we judge the performance of the incumbent government in light of the global economic situation? This is obviously really important because, as you were saying, uh, Reginald, they are going to take, take over a poison chalice anywhere, not just in Kenya, anyone coming into power at the moment. Um, could it be a situation of bad policies with outcomes worse than by COVID and, of course, the, the awful war um, that's going on in Ukraine. If we could just have one answer here, please, before I hand back to Agnes Gittau and we close the session. I think the question was directed to me. Um, I, I think it's a, it's a case of misdiagnosing what um, the Kenyan economy actually needs to, to grow. Uh, the last 10 years, were a capital intensive drive by the government building uh, railways to nowhere, expressways to nowhere. Um, for example, they have a habit of curing symptoms and not the problem. So the expressway in Nairobi is a symptom of traffic, but the real problem is the death of a rural economy, which has led to rural to urban migration at a larger scale. Everyone wants to be in Nairobi. So we have a traffic problem. Everyone wants to be in Nairobi, you have a housing problem. Everyone wants to be in Nairobi, you have a water problem. So instead of fixing that problem, uh, resuscitating the rural economy where 70% of the people are employed, they come and say, now we want to build affordable housing in Nairobi. We want to build uh, expressways in Nairobi so that uh, we reduce the, the traffic. And I'm thinking, no, stop people from coming to Nairobi by making sure I can be born in Kakamega. Uh, go to school in Kagameba uh, and work in Kagamega without ever wanting to go to Nairobi. So urbanize Kagamega. So the problem that Kenyan economy is in right now, one is treating symptoms and not the problems. Secondly, during Jubilee's first term, they borrowed around 3 trillion and we have only one major project to account for it, which is the SGR, which is even if you take the inflated cost around 400 billion, the question is where is that the 2.6 trillion? I'll check TikTok uh, for that <laughs> answer. I'm sure it will be given, but no, a round of applause. Thank you all so much. I'm so sorry, it's so condensed, so choppy, uh, but that's what it's like, especially when it's hybrid. Uh, but thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kenny Karaoke. Thank you so much, Samson Ochola. Really insightful as well, especially coming in at the last minute. Dr. Njoki couldn't make it, unfortunately. Uh, Reginald Kazutu, thank you. Um, John Mbiu, I know it's not John, but they put John here. We, you've got to, it's, it's near the one. Uh -huh, that's right, you see. You said it's John, it's not John. 
Um, and thank you so much, Robin Quinn. Thank you all so much. And thank you everybody for coming and staying. It's really great talking to you, really exciting uh, times ahead. And let's remain positive because we, 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 we love Africa. We're Pan-Africanists at heart. We're friends of Africa. So yes, there are lots of issues, but I still think there is, there's hope. There has to be, right? Without hope, there's nothing. <laughs> Absolutely, Juliana, and thank you very much, Juliana. You are a great moderator and you've just really made the conversation flow really greatly. Thank you so much. And really thank you to all of you for coming out in this really terrible hit. Uh, I guess for us Kenyans, I think this is nothing, I guess. And our great speakers, I really thank you. Our online participants, thank you so much. We'll be back again to discuss Nigeria and, the, and South Africa. And um, we remain uh, available to you if you need any information on East Africa and the rest of the African continent, please do not hesitate to contact any of our organization, the Royal Africa Society, uh, the East African Association and GPS Africa. And I'm also really grateful to Natasha, who's been really working behind the scenes, Horder and everybody from the Royal Africa Society. Thank you, Horder back there um and yeah we keep we keep our eyes open our ears on the ground on kenya most of us will be in nairobi really covering this um and we hope as juliana said let's remain positive i think kenya uh, for most of us who are very and most of us who are here who are very familiar with the economy this is just another step to our becoming a very very competitive democracy so we look forward to 8th of august thank you goodbye thank you